Thank you, Wally. Join me in the responsive call to worship. We have not seen the rise, risen Christ face to face. We have seen him, him in the lives of those transformed by grace. We have not touched his wounds from the cross. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Join us in singing our opening hymn, Thine is the Glory, 218 in your hymnal, 1 and 2. pray together. Life-giving God, thank you for the ways you continue to bring life out of death. We praise you for raising Jesus, for giving us your spirit, and for walking with us in the good times and the tough times. Jesus, as Thomas came to recognize Jesus, help us Jesus and those around us. Give us loving hearts and open hands so the Christ in each of us might respond to the Christ we recognize in each person we encounter. Amen. Jeannie, children's story? I'd like to invite all the children to come forward. Come on up. Come on up, everybody. I got a great story to tell you today. And when everybody gets here, God, good deal. Okay, one more. We gotta wait for Dwayne here. Hi, big guy. Gonna ask you guys a question. Did you have a good Easter? Uh huh. Did you get lots of candy? 
You eat lots of candy? Uh-huh. Easter is a special time. And Easter is a special time in the life of the church. And the story I'm going to tell you today is called Alive Again. And we have a lot of interaction. We have a lot of action in this story. So you guys got to play along with me. You get to stomp your feet and you get to bow your head and all that stuff. But we'd like to have the congregation join us too. So with that, let's go. Can you, when Jesus, can you see the pictures here? Okay, here we go, guys. When Jesus lived on earth, many people loved him. And they believed he was God's son. But some Jewish leaders were jealous of Jesus, and they didn't like him. And every time they heard Jesus talk about the Heavenly Father, God, they got mad. How do you look when you get mad? Give me a face. How, mm, yeah, kind of, kind of your lips go down and your eyes look mean. So as more and more people believed in Jesus, the Jewish leaders got madder and madder. Finally, they hated Jesus so much that they got together and they planned a way to kill him. Jesus knew that he would not live much longer. So he went to the garden to pray. Jesus asked his friends to pray with him. So let's bow our heads like we're praying with Jesus. But do you know what happened? His friends fell asleep. Roll your head from one side to the other and pretend that you're falling asleep. Take slow, deep breaths like a sleeping person does. Can we take slow? How do you sleep? Do you take a slow, deep breath? Just like, so get up, get up. That's what Jesus said to his sleeping friends. And they blinked their eyes and they shook their sleepy heads. Let's do that too. Kind of shake your heads like you're getting rid of that sleep. Shake your heads there. It's time to go, Jesus said. But go where, wondered the sleepy disciples. Then all at once, stomp, stomp, tramp, tramp. The soldiers came marching right into their camp. Let's march with our feet, with the soldiers. And the soldiers came right up to Jesus. They had swords and they had clubs. And they grabbed Jesus and they took him away. They hit Jesus, and then they nailed him to the cross where he died. The people who didn't believe in Jesus laughed at him, and they made fun of him as he hung on the cross. But you know what? Jesus loved them anyway. He prayed for the people who were hurting him. Father, he said, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. Jesus' friends didn't know what to do. They didn't know why Jesus had to die. And they didn't know by dying that Jesus could pay for all the wrong things that everyone does. Then all at once, the sky grew dark because it's dark outside. Cover your eyes. And it got darker and darker. And the earth started to shake and rumble. So stomp your feet again like the earth is rumbling. And then Jesus died. Everyone was afraid. One of the soldiers who put Jesus on the cross said, he really was the Son of God. Can you say that? He really was the Son of God. Joseph, a friend of Jesus, took Jesus' body and put it in a tomb. A tomb is, is like a cave. What's it like in a tomb? Can you guys tell me what it's like in a dark. dark? Is it quiet in the tomb? Yeah, maybe some bats in there. Uh, Soldiers rolled a big stone in front of that tomb so no one could get in. It was a heavy, heavy stone. So let's pretend to push that big rock away. Can you push that rock away? Push. Jesus' friends cried together for two days. Then on Sunday morning, some women went to Jesus' tomb to put special oils and perfumes on his body. Can you smell the perfume? Pretend? <laughs> Isn't it nice? <laughs> Just, okay. When the women got to the tomb, there was a big surprise waiting for them. What do you think it was? What do you think that big surprise was? Jesus that lives. Jesus lives. And that big, heavy stone was rolled away. And the women looked around, but they didn't see anyone who might have moved the stone, even 
if the tomb was dark and scary. The women did peek inside, and what do you think they saw? Did anyone know what they saw? They saw clothes, an angel. An angel was there. What would you do if you saw an angel? You might be afraid, maybe, something you've never seen before, or it might be very glorious. And that's exactly what the angel said. She said, don't be afraid. I know you're looking for Jesus, but he's not here. He's alive. He's alive. Jesus is alive. Run and tell your friends that Jesus is alive and that you'll get to see him soon. That was the very first Easter. Jesus celebrated together with his friends because Jesus now is alive. And we celebrate Easter every year. So let's everybody clap your hands because Jesus is alive. And with that, let's bow our heads and repeat after me. Dear God, we thank you for your son Jesus. We know he is alive. And he is alive in our hearts. Amen. Thank you for coming. Have a good week, everybody. Let's bow our heads and pray. Oh God, open your eyes to the presence of the risen Christ among us and allow our vision of your Son to transform our doubts into faith, our fear into love, and our despair into hope. Grant us peace and joy and compassion and generosity. Oh God of light, in you there is no darkness. If we walk in the light as you are in the light, we have fellowship with one another. We walk as disciples together. As God of mercy, you have called us to live in the light of your love and to walk in the way of your commandments. You have claimed us for yourself and joined us together in the fellowship as the body of Christ. We remember those in grief and pain, those suffering from illness or loneliness, those needing a word of comfort, support, those affected by discriminations of all kinds. We pray this morning for our pastor Arlene as she recovers from hip surgery. Thank you for the doctor and medical teams that surrounded her. Bring peace to her heart and healing to her body. We come before you, God, in a time of confession. For those times when we move in the shadows unaware of unwilling to be aware of how our actions affect others, bring us into the light that we might we might find joy. For those times when we deceive ourselves, not revealing to ourselves or others the true nature of our vulnerabilities and fears, bring us together in truth that we might find forgiveness in fellowship. For those times when, we, when life has been revealed and we have ignored or denied it, bring us together to touch grace in the presence of Christ. Bless this gathered community, loving God. Bless us as disciples together. Give us wisdom, strength, and insight to nurture and sustain one another. Remembering always that we serve a risen Lord who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel according to John, chapter 20, verses 19 to 31. And this is from the Common English Bible Translation. 
It was still the first day of the week. That evening, while the disciples were behind closed doors because they were afraid of the Jewish authorities, Jesus came and stood among them. He said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. When the disciples saw the Lord, they were filled with joy. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you don't forgive them, they aren't forgiven. Thomas, the one called Didymus, one of the twelve, wasn't with the disciples when Jesus came. The other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But he replied, unless I see the nail marks in his hands, put my finger in the wounds left by the nails and put my hand into his side, I won't believe. After eight days, his disciples were again in a house and Thomas was with them. Even though the doors were locked, Jesus entered and stood among them. He said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. Look at my hands. Put your hand into my side. No more disbelief. Believe. Thomas responded to Jesus, my Lord and my God. Jesus replied, do you believe because you see me? Happy are those who don't see and yet believe. Then Jesus did many other miraculous signs in his disciples' presence, signs that aren't recorded in this scroll. But these things are written so that you will believe that Jesus is the Christ, God's Son, and that, believing, you will have life in his name. May God add God's blessing to the hearing of this word. Will you bow your heads with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts together be pleasing unto you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. It's the morning of the first day of the week, Sunday. Two days after Jesus of Nazareth had been executed by the Roman Empire, Mary Magdala went to the tomb at first light to dress the body according to Jewish custom. But when she gets there, the stone has been rolled away. She races to get Simon Peter and the beloved disciple, and together the three of them see a tomb with scraps of linen, but no body. The beloved disciple and Peter go back to the room where the other disciples are staying. But Mary Magdala is still at the tomb crying. And when she looks into the tomb again, she sees two angels who repeat what Jesus had been telling them. On the third day, he would rise again. And when she turns around, she sees Jesus And not that she recognizes him, but I mean, is that really such a surprise? Like, he's supposed to be dead. She wouldn't exactly be looking for him to show up outside his own tomb. But when he calls her by name, she recognizes him. She runs to tell the other disciples. It's evening of the first day of the week. Sunday. The disciples are gathered in a locked room. It doesn't appear that they believed Mary Magdala's testimony of meeting the risen Christ. Jesus, though, was never one to let a locked door stand in his way. He appears among them. He shows them his wounds. They finally believe. There is one disciple missing, though. Thomas called Didymus happened to not be there. 
He didn't believe the disciples' account any more than they seemed to have believed Mary's. He told them that he wanted to see Jesus and his wounds himself. And that is how he got branded as Doubting Thomas. But I think Thomas got a bad rep. I was recently introduced to the concept of FOMO, fear of missing out. FOMO is the apprehension that one is either not in the know about or missing out on information, events, experiences, etc. Let me tell you, it explained a lot. I always wanted to be part of conversations because what if they were talking about something fun and I missed it? Or wanted to go to a party, what if they were having fun and I was missing out? Or if I declined an invitation, I worried that not participating had been the wrong choice. Underneath FOMO, is the understanding that shared experiences bring us closer together. At reunions, we immediately start reminiscing about experiences we had had together. The poor plus ones would be so lost and probably very bored because listening to someone talk about an experience is not the same thing as sharing that experience with them. Thomas had discovered that. The disciples had been in a locked room together, and Jesus appeared and showed them his wounds. Let me repeat this again. Jesus appeared and without prompting showed them his wounds. The disciples recognized the Lord and were filled with joy. They now had this shared experience. They had seen the risen Lord. They had seen the wounds that he bore, and they had received the Holy Spirit. But Thomas missed out. When the other disciples told him of their experience, he didn't immediately buy in. I personally don't think that Thomas didn't believe that Jesus had risen as much as Thomas wanted to share the disciples' experience. He wanted to be in the room where it happened. He wanted the same experience that the other disciples had already had. And the other disciples didn't have to believe without seeing the wounds. Jesus had shown up and showed them without their asking. They had been in the room where it happened, and Thomas just wanted that too. I think that a lot of us, if we were being totally honest with ourselves, would want the same thing. We want to be in the room where it happened. We fear missing out. We want the shared experiences that bring us closer to God and closer to each other. This is a story as much about community as it is about the individuals. And it is easy for us to miss that. American culture is largely individualistic. We, as a country, have tended to prize the individual over the community. So we focus on Thomas and his lack of immediate buy-in, and what we miss is the community. A large group of people gathered in one place is going to draw attention. The safest thing for a bunch of people who were afraid for their lives would be to scatter, to hide in the general population, to pretend to be ordinary and to have never heard of Jesus of Nazareth. But that's not what they did. 
They risked drawing attention because being together was more important. They understood the importance of community. In 2,000 years, the importance of community, of being together, has not gone away. We still have the need to be together in the room where it happened. The problem comes when we don't recognize that need. I heard a hypothesis recently that the reason for the dramatic uptick and polarizing tribalism and violence and its root causes of fear and hate is because we have an epidemic of loneliness. More and more people, especially in urban areas, don't know their neighbors' names. I mean, I can attest to this. I live in a suburban area, and while I can tell you what house owns what dog, I can't tell you the names of the people who live there, people I've lived next to for almost three years. And the downside of this is that I am reluctant to go to them when I need help, like getting my car jumped. They may have the cutest little dog who sits in the window and judges my attempts to back into my garage in a straight line, but I don't know them well enough to ask for help. We can like it this way. I, emphasis on I, I can do this by myself. But the truth is, humanity was created to be in community with one another. All the way back at the beginning of humanity's story, when God created Adam out of some cosmic dust and divine spit, God immediately said, it is not good for Adam to be alone. FOMO or not, it is not good for us to be alone. Community is not a luxury, it is an imperative. And that's why we gather in churches to worship God together, to pray together, to read and study scripture together, to stave off isolating loneliness together. Even when Jesus' disciples were terrified of the Jewish authorities, they still gathered together in one room. In their fear, they recognized the need for each other's support. And later, they rejoiced at Jesus' resurrection, and not just with the ones in the room where it happened, but also the ones with Thomas who had his Jesus experience eight days later, and the hundreds and thousands of people who came to believe because of their testimony. As that testimony spread, more and more churches sprang up across the Roman Empire. They knew how important it was to stay connected with each other. Apostles traveled circuits and shared news of other churches. The churches themselves sent messengers to each other with letters full of news and encouragement, blessings, and prayers. Wealthier churches sent resources along with those messengers. I mean, sure, the apostles had their disagreements, and so did the churches, but that didn't detract them from the truth that they were in this thing called life and faith together. In the Christian church in the upper Midwest, we call this being disciples together. The very first line of our bylaws is a disciples together form of ministry. I love it. We have vital ministries because we are disciples together. We gather at the communion table each time we worship, and we know that 
our congregation is not the only one in the region gathering around that table at that very moment. We are disciples together. No matter what building or not, we may be in at the moment. And I love being disciples together because that means we still know 2,000 years after Jesus of Nazareth turned the world upside down that we are still in this thing called life and faith together. And isn't that a beautiful thing? May it be so. A big thank you to uh, Reverend Lisa Grace for um, her wanting to be a peep. <clears throat> the just resurrected Jesus appeared to his disciples, showing up in a room behind locked doors. He stood among them, greeting them with, Peace be with you. John tells us Jesus breathed on the disciples and invited them to receive the Holy Spirit. We don't really know the specifics, yet I imagine this is a terrific gift, empowering the disciples to act as Jesus had acted. Nearly 2,000 years later, we read the stories and hear the testimonies of those whose lives have been completely changed because they've uh, come to, the, uh, to understand they, too, have received God's Spirit. Empowered believers share their gifts operating as the hands and feet of Jesus. We see that in our own congregation. And what about you? How are you sharing the gift of God's spirit? It may be in the financial support that you offer. It may be in the ways you use your time to feed the hungry, clothe those who need clothing, or advocate for those who are struggling. In this offering time, we invite you to share as you are able. May the peace of Christ be with you as you offer your money, your time, and your talent. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, thank you for this opportunity to remember Jesus giving your spirit to the disciples. Thank you not only for your ability to give gifts, but for all who actually give to support and lift up life of this congregation and our varied ministries. Help us use each gift to the max, filled with gratitude. In your name we pray. Amen.
In John's gospel, it took Thomas seeing the resurrected Jesus for him to believe such an extraordinary fact. Two millennia later, we don't see Jesus with the, his damaged hands inside, but we have the gifts of bread and cup. In these elements, we recognize Jesus in the bread which was broken and the cup which was poured out. We remember the way Jesus instituted this meal on the night he, just before he was betrayed, arrested, and condemned to be crucified. Just as Thomas recognized Jesus standing before him, so we are invited to recognize the presence of our Messiah, our Christ, as we share this meal. Let us give thanks. All are invited to participate in this meal of remembrance and thanksgiving. Our communion song is, Here, O oh my God, I see thy face to face, 416 and verses 1 and 2. How very good it is, God of love, to be drawn together in community, one with another, to partake of this meal. Here we lay aside our differences and disagreements and recognize the one who weaves us together into one fabric of love, our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Here as we eat bread and drink of the cup, we recognize and affirm the love Christ has for us and the love that we are called to have for one another. Here we pray that, our, that your spirit will work within us and among us to guide us on your path of love. In your name we pray, amen. On that night that Jesus sat at table with his disciples, he took a loaf of bread and he broke it open. He said, this is my body. It is broken for you. Take this, eat this, and remember me. We eat the bread now as we remember Jesus. And also that night he took a cup. And when he had given thanks... He poured and blessed it. This is my new covenant. I won't drink this again until I drink it with you in the kingdom of God. Take this, drink it, and remember me.
Please join together in singing the closing hymn. Halle, halle, hallelujah. Woo! 41, sing it twice, please. job. <laughs> uh, we have confessed that Jesus is our Lord and our God. Let us go now in peace, empowered by the Holy Spirit to proclaim this good news to the world. Amen. Amen. Have a great week, everyone. And remember, there's just a couple things if you, if you feel free to, to give some donations. Thank you.